Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. The cachalot, or sperm whale, is the largest of the toothed whales. Bulls today often reach 16 meters in weights of around 50 tons, and 18 meter bulls weighing over 60 tons are recorded. As one of the most sexually dimorphic of all cetaceans, females are much smaller, rarely exceeding 10 meters. This species was a favorite target of the whaling industry, and large specimens were favored. As a result of the steep population loss, average sizes today are often said to be smaller than in the past. Exceptional historical specimens include bulls that may have reached 24 meters and cows up to 13 meters, though it must be said these were exceptional specimens. Most would have been closer to the averages we encounter today. In fact, there are reviews of historical lengths that indicate that not much has changed, just that higher historic populations naturally resulted in a higher frequency of more enormous individual outliers. Sperm whales receive their common name from their spermaceti. This waxy substance is located in an organ within their enormous head. It was said to be erroneously thought to be where whales store their semen, hence the name, though this may well have been intended humorously. The reality of its function is debated, with leading theories being a use in regulating buoyancy given the depths that they dive, in conjunction with their melon for echolocation, or both. Sperm whales are also called cachalot, thought to be an archaic French word meaning large tooth, and is favored by the assembly because of its distance from the misinformation of spermaceti. Spermaceti, along with the ample oily blubber insulating the animal, was largely the reason for its extensive targeting by whalers. Spermaceti is an odorless substance and therefore excellent foundation for concentrated fragrances and other cosmetic uses. Ambergris, wax which serves to form around squid beaks to prevent damage to the intestines, has similar qualities and was another source of their commercial value in this animal. Sperm whales are the only living member of their immediate clade, though the cogids are close relatives. The specifics of this relationship is not well understood, but they do form a clade. Cachalot feed primarily on a diet of squid. While cachalot hunting giant squid are often dramatized as context of equals, the reality is of predator massacring abundant prey. A large bull cachalot consume over a dozen giant squid in a single dive, and they will consume over a hundred in a day when hunting smaller species. This specialization in cephalopods appears to be a derived diet. The ancestral sperm whales were much more generalized. The earliest known sperm whales were analogous to dolphins hunting a range of fish and squid. One lineage went on to become formidable predators, reaching their pinnacle in Leviathan, a formidable hunter that was the only animal to dare challenge the god-shark Megalodon during its Miocene reign. It appears this specialization in cephalopods is a fairly recent evolution. Likely independent between cogids and true sperm whales, though their fossil record is extremely fragmentary. We know a lot more about the prehistoric coastal sperm whales like Acrophyceter because when they died, their bones fell into sediment we have access to, especially in the Mediterranean and Pacific coast of the Americas where coastal waters of the Miocene are now far enough inland for easy access. Deep ocean specialists of squid, on the other hand, are much less likely to be preserved in ways that we can readily find. We only have a few tooth, jaw, and body fossils of their direct lineage, and it's not a lot to go on. In Chimere, the coastal predator lineage has a long and proud history going back to the first harvest in the aftermath of the dynastic extinction. Both in North and South America, several species of coastal macropredatory sperm whale were collected and they competed with Squalodon and the resident Mosasaurs as vassal predators under the mighty Megalodon. 
On the other hand, sperm whales of the modern size and lifestyle are virtually unknown in the fossil record of Chimera. However, the Chimeran cachalot is extremely common in the oceans and around the known world, found throughout the deep oceans but especially abundant within the Great Kaleen Sea. An especially deep secondary subduction zone has formed just south of the islands as the mostly submerged picardio kaleen continental plate crashed into Arvel. This deep canyon running along an otherwise fairly shallow sea is the perfect hunting ground for cachalot. The canyon isn't particularly active tectonically, though there is a fairly regular stream of nutrients churned up by the slow tectonic motion to support a productive marine ecosystem. It is packed with squid. Cows can take turns diving to hunt, while other members of the pod remain in shallow waters to keep watch over calves not yet ready for open water. Cachalot can dive as deep as 2 kilometers in search of prey, but generally prefer between 300 and 1,000 meters, which gets them right into the most productive zone of this canyon. Though the natural history of the Chimeran cachalot is not known with tremendous confidence, a few aspects of its anatomy and behavior are illuminating. It is generally accepted that they were introduced to Chimere from the Western Pacific during the Pleistocene 1.5 million years ago. This was an era of generally colder temperatures throughout Chimere with a lower sea level hitting the marine ecosystems pretty hard. While there were already several squid specialists, mostly among the beaked whales but also including the elasmosaur Cadunuk, it seems something about this context and its changes favored the rapid success of the Chimeran cachalot. They have spread throughout the southern hemisphere with a small population that also crossed the equatorial barrier. These cachalot are all of the same species, Physeter chimerensis. If there is any genetic influence of our modern sperm whale species, Physeter macrocephalus, it has not been detected in the few genetic studies thus far conducted. This has led some naturalists in the assembly to propose that sperm whales of Earth may not have reached the Atlantic until the Pleistocene harvest of Africa 250,000 years ago, though it could simply be a matter of them and any possible cachalot harvest from the mid-Pleistocene off the coast of Europe simply didn't hybridize or fail to outcompete the now-established Chimeran species. The most recognizable difference between the two species is the Chimeran cachalot's tallest dorsal ridge forming a more noticeable fin, but there are some other markers. Young have pronounced countershading. It is presumed that this may be a degree of camouflage as the Large sharks and mosasaur that predate upon them have far superior eyes than the orcas, which are their only natural predators on Earth. However, adults do not possess this, and instead have a uniform dark gray or brown coloration. As cachalot are assumed to hunt upside down like sperm whales of Earth, and the squid they favor have keen vision, a pale belly would be detrimental. Chimera and cachalot also have more robust jaws and fewer but larger teeth, presuming to aid in the capture and subduel of larger kraken species. It is particularly noticeable in the males. Most squid they target are quite small, but they have been observed bringing down even the mighty horned kraken up to the surface to break it apart. However, despite the jaws being more robust, they are still quite laterally compressed. It is assumed that even if they tend to have selective pressure for an average of larger prey than sperm whales of Earth, and larger jaws also benefit them in fighting against the many predators, not to mention other cachalot, there is still a great benefit in having narrow jaws. When they swim upside down, with narrow jaws and a wide head, and eyes capable of bulging out, they can see up and around the jaws, thus seeing the silhouette of squid. From this vantage point, looking directly up at a silhouette, they can reliably see and quickly open their jaws to grab or suck in prey. Though this visual hunting is important, and certainly more so than one would assume from most discussion of the animal, the sense they are most famous for employing on a hunt is echolocation. As far as the assembly knows, the function of Chimera and Cachalot echolocation is identical to that of sperm whales on Earth. 
Clicks produced just below the blowhole from the now vestigial right nostril shoot back through the spermaceti organ, are redirected out through the melon, which the sound is focused and directed. Some of the sound is pushed back through the spermaceti organ and back again through the melon, enabling a multiple feedback pulse throughout the same sound. This all happens through less than a second, of course, yet, while it may be the same to our ears, it does seem to enable a more nuanced field of sonar. When searching for prey, they produce slow, steady clicks. These have a great distance, but not much acuity. As they hone in on a target, the clicks increase in frequency, eventually becoming quite rapid. These rapid clicks don't have the same range, but are more precise, important as they close in on a target. Once prey is captured, if it's small enough to swallow, it will rapidly be suctioned in. Often, the teeth aren't even involved. However, when grappling larger targets like kraken, smaller crakes, or the occasional shark or skate, they will bite and either crush or twist to break it apart into more manageable pieces. They have been observed performing a death roll similar to crocodiles, especially if the larger prey is near the surface, using the force against the surface to increase the damage. Bull cachalot breaching with a large kraken in their jaws and smashing it against the surface is one of the more spectacular sights reported by Akanuk whalers. As humans do on Earth, Chimerans hunt these mighty leviathans. The Akanuk are an ethnic group of Kaleen who are particularly famous whalers. They bring down these beasts mostly for blubber, spermaceti, and ambergris, though the meat is also used. Unfortunately, Chimeran whalers need to contend with Mosasaurs and Megalodon, not to mention an abundance of smaller predators like Xanatel that spy hop to see what the ship is up to. It is not uncommon for Megalodon to follow Akanuk whaling ships and close in once they make a kill. Both shark and whalers seek the whale's blubber. Because of this, the Akanuk prefer herding cachalot into shallow harbors where the shark will be reluctant to follow, but this is very challenging considering cachalot are likely to dive when injured or threatened. After all, the predators that pose a threat are all coastal or surface hunters. Nothing in the abyss is a regular threat. The sonar they use to locate prey can also be a fairly potent asset in the actual capture. It is possible that these clicks can be powerful enough to stun prey, though this theory is not universally accepted. It seems disorientation is more likely as even the most powerful clicks fall far below what squid can endure in tests conducted on Earth. These clicks are useful on prey, and can also be focused against predators. Motomazor and Megalodon don't rely heavily on hearing, but there are a few accounts suggesting a focused blast can disorient, likely due to impacting the inner ear more than the actual sound detection. Even with this and the force of ramming and biting, Megalodon and Motomazor have been documented successfully killing even large adult bulls. Most cachalot would prefer to dive when they detect approaching predators, with the only largest bulls bringing the fight to these hunters. Thankfully, their long-range clicks are usually sufficient in detecting an approaching threat. With a top speed of 40 km per hour, they can usually get below a predator's comfortable depths before the threat closes in. Very young calves are more vulnerable and are the slowest member of the pod, and it is for their sake that most fights occur. Bulls cannot endure for long in the warmest waters where calves are most comfortable, but they're where their ranges do intersect, bulls often remain fairly close to pods as long as there's enough food. Conversely, the largest bulls prefer to hunt in the colder, more prolific waters toward Kaishel, and cows prefer to mate with the larger bulls, so bulls that remain in warmer waters are at a distinct reproductive disadvantage, and it should come as no surprise that most often prefer to migrate to southern waters, even if it leaves the young vulnerable. Thankfully, calves are most often born during the spring, which is a more strict mating and calving season than earth sperm whales, 
So at their smallest, and in their most vulnerable months, they are usually a few enormous defenders around. Bulls may not provide direct parental care, but their inclination to rush to the sound of distress means that they are often kept others of their kind safe. Sperm whales of Earth are well documented to defend injured or impaired members of their pod. This behavior is especially amplified in the Chimerian species. Bulls in particular will come to the sound of other distressed cachalot and even other cetaceans. As they are larger than the average in Earth species, with old bulls often reaching 20 meters, they can by sheer size dominate most animals in the oceans of Chimer. Even the largest megalodon will flee a 25 meter bull. Cachalot are often recorded to rescue dozens of cetacean species and even distressed Chimeran sailors. That said, they do seem to recognize the whaler ships. This may come from personal experience or education from their elders. While they were rescue sailors from a storm-wrecked ship, pushing them toward shore, large bull cachalot are well known to attack whaler ships with the same vitriol they assault mosasaurs, lasmosaurs, orcas, and megalodon. In some instances, the assault is with such ferocity that they may sink the ship, but the whale stains enough injuries that it perishes alongside the sailors. This is the inciting incident of Frost and Famine, seventh story in the first Tales of Chimere anthology, wherein a bull cachalot is injured from an earlier hunt, returns to enact revenge for its injuries and the hunting of its kind. The remains of the ship are run aground in unfamiliar territory, and Kirut and a few fellow relatives must seek out the residents of the islands to secure rights to use local lumber to repair their vessel. This brings them to the village of Hutaket, which prepares to fend off a threat of their own, though their force of nature is far more supernatural than an enraged and injured whale. I won't, wouldn't wish to spoil the ending, but if you enjoy supernatural horror, it's one of my favorites I've written. I have an episode on the Hizuki, antagonist of that story, linked here. It must be said that 95% of cachalot bulls are below 18 meters. However, at their tremendous size, with the largest bulls attaining lengths of 25 meters and well over 100 tons, it should come as no surprise that cachalot are often cited as amongst, if not the largest animals in Chimer. Several titanosaur species are longer, and megalodon, trowler sharks, and the comanca of the northern hemisphere approach their mass, but the largest bull cachalot currently holds the record ever reliably estimated by the assembly in terms of mass. This bull, largest beast of Chimere, is still smaller than the largest blue whales by a substantial margin. It is often remarked by the assembly that for all the tremendous giants found in this enormous planet, it can seem odd that modern Earth still holds the record for the largest animal, and by a considerable margin. Still, these whales are a formidable presence in the marine ecosystems of Chimere, both as predator and prey. Cheers to Peter for sponsoring this episode. Sperm whales have been amongst my favorite animals my whole life, and it feels quite fitting to cover them on my birthday. Thanks again to Peter for the sponsorship, to my Patreon patrons for your support, and thank you for watching. Cheers, folks!